So occasionally I get asked by you guys just what are the best sources of protein that one can eat and more importantly can you give us some examples so that we may add a little bit more variety and flavor to our diets. And to be honest I have thought this doesn't need a full video. I mean everyone knows this by now. Hell just ask these guys. Chicken. Chicken. Chicken breast. Chicken breast. Chicken breast. Grilled chicken. 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 Yeah. On second thought. So for the purposes of this video, we are going to evaluate the quality of these protein sources through three different quantitative metrics. Number one, from the overall quality of the protein source itself, there are so many ways to analyze this. You know, you can look at things like absorption, bioavailability, amino acid profile, specific, you know, amino acid concentrations of things like, you know, leucine, for example. There's a lot of different things to take into consideration. So it would be nice if there was one magic number, one magic score, which could summarize all of this. Fortunately, there is. We are going to be looking at the protein digestibility corrected amino acid score or the PDCAAS. This is a really simple way of essentially evaluating the quality of a protein from multiple various aspects, such as how your body actually utilizes it, you know, and absorbs it, and the actual overall bioavailability of that protein source, and in addition, the overall amino acid profile. Because if you can absorb a protein, but it's only got, you know, half the amino acids your body actually needs to put on muscle, well then it doesn't really matter. Number two, we are going to be looking at secondary nutrients in that protein source, you know, things besides protein that is found in that food, such as fat, carbohydrates, sugar, fiber, saturated fat, all these different things. And finally, the third and probably most important factor we are going to be analyzing, the overall cost of the protein. And by the way, we're going to be using a calculation throughout this video to just, you know, overall simplify things. We are going to be looking at grams of protein per dollar spent. Whether you're looking at a kilo of chicken a pound of steak, a can of tuna. Overall, throughout this video, I have already done the math and broken this down for the overall number of grams of protein you get per one dollar American that you spend. Okay guys, welcome to my new sexy filming studio. And by that, I mean I just moved the whiteboard into a different room. The benefit of me now doing these videos in this room is that Jordan can let me know if I'm ever like, oh Igor, you're not, you're, you're not looking as big as you need to be for this shot. Don't worry, emergency pump. Now, with that being said, our first source is Okay, we're gonna be breaking it down into three different versions of everybody's favorite chicken. We got regular old boneless skinless chicken breast. We got like the cheap man's chicken breast. That's the one where you go into the store. You see it comes like these big packs. It's got the skin, it's got the bone. It's pretty much like they cut it off the chicken, put it in like styrofoam and served it right up to you. And then we got dark meat. This essentially I am referring to things like thighs, drumsticks. The first thing I need to mention is that fantastically, chicken has an excellent protein score. 95 on the PDCAAS, and that's not surprising at all. In general, animal-based protein sources are going to be very excellent sources uh, in terms of absorption, bioavailability, and most importantly, amino acid profile. There's this thing that some people like to refer to as complete or incomplete protein sources. Complete protein sources are those that have the entire range of amino acids, especially essential amino acids, whereas incomplete, as the name implies, they do not contain the entire spectrum of essential amino acids, the amino acids your body actually needs to get from food. It can't synthesize itself, and it needs to do this not just for general health, but obviously muscle protein synthesis. But fortunately, with chicken and many animal-based sources, that's not a problem. But here is where things start to break down a little bit, because if you actually look at the overall price standpoint, 1934 and give or take around 21. Now this is something which a lot of people shy away with, but like, listen, I'm gonna give you like the best piece of advice I can to anybody out there who is younger, maybe you're in high school, maybe you're in college, maybe you're just someone who in a, is you know, in a financial position where you don't feel like spending a hundred bucks a month on chicken breast and protein sources. Go to the grocery store. I used to do this, like I would get 10, 15 pounds of it every month back when I was in college. I was like 19, I was broke. I was living on student debt. I had like a budget in my mind of 40 bucks a week 
for groceries. I'd buy like 10 or 15 pounds of it. I'd bring it home in a backpack. And then what I would do is just like turn on some music, turn on a podcast and spend like 30 or 40 minutes, take all this chicken, unpack it. I would rip off the skin, get rid of the bone, try to keep as much meat as I possibly can. And then I'd get like a hundred pack of Ziploc bags and I would start to kind of like compartmentalize them. I'd put like one or two breasts into these little um, Ziploc baggies and then I would throw like a few of them in the fridge which I would eat over the course of the week and then everything else would go in a freezer. You know, me and my roommates, we chipped in and got this massive freezer for like 80 bucks on Craigslist. And this way I have chicken pretty much for the next month which is an excellent protein source both in terms of obviously its score and in this case in terms of price. And also in a similar case is dark meat. Not only is it a little cheaper, not a huge difference, but if you actually look at the secondary nutrients nutrients. 3 grams of fat per 30 grams of protein when it comes to breast and only 10 grams of fat per 30 grams of protein in terms of fat when it comes to more dark meat chicken. It's really not that bad. And to all you guys out there saying, but oh, it's so bad for you because of, you know, things like saturated fat. No, not really. It's only got about 1.5 grams of saturated fat per 30 grams of protein that you get from dark meat chicken. And let's be honest, it tastes a lot better. Next on the docket, we got everybody's favorite steak slash beef slash just eating cows in general. And once again, not surprisingly, the protein score in this case is an excellent 92. It's not 100, but it's anything above the 90s, you're, you're getting an excellent uh, protein source. Now, from a pricing standpoint, this is where things actually get a little interesting because if you go to the store and you just, for example, in the case of looking at ground beef, you got the regular, you got the, the leaner version, we're talking like 90, 10, versus 30, 70. You're likely to immediately think, well, of course, you know, the fatter one is cheaper. It's the regular one. You got to pay a little of that extra premium to get the leanness. But the problem is if you're looking from a purely food standpoint, yeah, you're, you're not wrong. However, if you're looking from a protein standpoint, because although the lean version costs more, but it's got significantly more protein, your actual cost savings are a lot better because you're getting more protein per dollar spent than the regular ground beef, despite the fact that obviously Obviously, this one usually is like what? Half the price. And when it comes to the other kinds of steak, obviously, guys, there's like a thousand different cuts of steak. There's a thousand different countries and stores. I'm just using a local, regular, mid price grocery store. Uh, in my neighborhood, if you're looking at like a nice, we're talking about something like maybe like a New York strip loin or like a ribeye steak, like a nice, fat, juicy uh, ribeye, it's about nine grams of protein per dollar. So it's a little bit more on the pricey side. Now, if you get into a leaner option, it's going to be a lot better, but still not nearly as good as we saw chicken just a few minutes earlier. And let's be honest, this one, it tastes like shit. This is where, to be honest, this might be a little bit of a controversial opinion, but in my opinion, especially when you are eating to kind of, you know, mitigate fat gain or ideally fat loss when you are cutting steak and, you know, cow in general actually kind of starts to fall apart as a protein source because 15 grams of fat per 30 grams of protein for lean ground beef. It's funny because like that's the leaner version and honestly, it's not even, it's not even that lean. It's ground beef, 62 grams of fat a two to one ratio of fat to protein, it's not even a protein source. It's a fat source with some protein sprinkled on top. You just might as well literally just get rid of this out of your mind right now. Steak, the kind of good kind, we're talking like ribeyes. Again, it's actually unfortunately a relatively similar issue with 27 per 30, it's almost a one to one ratio of fat to protein. You pretty much want like a one to three ratio of fat to protein, meaning that there's like three times more protein than there is fat or carbs or anything else we're gonna list on this video. In this case, being a one to one, it's for me, like it, it's not ideal. Again, unless you are someone who might be bulking, who is okay with having a higher fat intake, especially if you're on a high fat diet, such as like a, the, the, you know, the ketogenic diet, then this is fantastic. But if you're someone like me, who wants to kind of mitigate his fat intake, especially when you are cutting, which I'm doing oftentimes for half the year, this becomes kind of problematic. Uh, fortunately, when it comes to the final steak option, it's a lot less fat, making this a much more reasonable protein source, aside from the fact that, again, it tastes like crap. I disagree. Next up, now we're gonna get a little bit, uh, a little bit more creative. Fish, or just in general, uh, seafood. Now, once again, because we're looking at an animal-based 
uh, protein source, the protein score is overwhelmingly very good. It was kind of hard to find actual sources for this, especially for each of these individually, but it seems like in general, seafood and fish is again, similar to beef somewhere in uh, the low to mid nineties. Now, when it comes to the cost effectiveness, this is where things start to break down a little bit. First things first, everybody's favorite tuna. We are talking about not the fancy one that you get at like the seafood butcher shop. No, we're talking about regular old can tuna from a cost uh, standpoint 22 grams of protein uh, per dollar spent again this could fluctuate a little bit but that is overall very good and most importantly this is probably one of the only sources on my list which is almost purely protein it's got literally 0 0.5 grams of fat per 30 grams of protein and obviously pretty much nothing else zero carbs zero fiber you name it it's just protein. However, there is one caveat when it comes to tuna. I think a lot of you guys, you know, know where I'm going with this, and that is the mercury problem. As we know that tuna is kind of a big fish. You guys maybe learned this in school. The little fish is eaten by the bigger fish, which is eaten by the bigger fish, which is eaten by tuna, which is a really big fish. And as this, this it's the circle of life, or except in this case, it's the circle of mercury because that mercury goes from fish to fish to fish and it's accumulated and it could technically be i don't want to say dangerous but it's not necessarily the healthiest thing to do however there are two things that you could do to mitigate this which is what i personally do number one is always go for skipjack tuna 90 percent of the time there's only two versions of tuna you can find skipjack tuna which is usually the cheaper one it probably doesn't taste as good or at least in my opinion and you've got albacore tuna which is usually a little bit more expensive the problem with albacore is that it is a significantly bigger fish it's a bigger tuna and again that's going to accumulate a lot more mercury three times times more mercury actually uh, to be exact so if you can always go for the skipjack option and just try to limit it I'm not saying eat tuna every day but at the same time I'm not telling you that you should never touch it you're lucky if you can get one can of tuna per month no you're gonna be fine me for example in my personal case I'll probably have anywhere from two to three cans of skipjack tuna uh, per week uh, I put it in a salad, I put it in sandwiches, I put it just random stuff. Like, I'm a big fan. It's cheap, it tastes good, why not? And as long as you limit yourself and kind of opt more so for that skipjack option, you're gonna be fine. And you should, because it's an, as you can tell by these numbers, it is a fantastic source of protein. Okay, next up, we got some more traditional fish. We got salmon and tilapia. There's a thousand others I can talk about, but I think these two are very popular. Right off the bat, it's a little expensive. I mean, you're only getting about nine grams of protein per dollar spent, which is not uh, that great. And tilapia is actually, is fortunately very good from a fat standpoint, coming in at four grams uh, fat per pro for 30 grams of protein. Tilapia overall is a very good fish. The only problem is that a lot of people don't want to eat it all the time and it's a little pricey. Salmon, on the other hand, is a little bit higher in fat coming in at 19 grams of fat per 30 gram serving, which is a big reason why a lot of times people don't necessarily eat salmon as a protein source, particularly when they are cutting. However, this, I think it is a little over exaggerated because it's still not a crazy amount of fat and this is very healthy fat. These fat is very little of it is saturated fat. The majority of this fat is actually coming from poly and mono unsaturated fats, which some people like to refer to as the good or the healthy fats. So it's still a very excellent healthy protein source, which I do recommend people try to include in their diet if they don't mind a slightly higher fat intake and obviously somewhat of an expensive price tag. Now, this last one, this is where we're gonna get really creative, and this this is interesting, bear with me. Ocean mol mollusks, whatever the fuck that says. This is like scallops, oysters, mussels, kind of like these, you know those little weird like shellfish or crustaceans? I don't know what the terminology is. Now, obviously from a price standpoint, it's terrible. It's pretty much the worst on this entire list. Uh, the fat intake is also pretty low, it's around four grams, but the big benefit to why I wanted to include it on this list is for ethical reasons. Now, bear with me, because a lot of people out there, you might be in a position where you're kind of like, listen, I don't want to eat regular animals from ethical reasons, right? This is a big reason why people go vegetarian or vegan, because they have a problem with eating cows or chicken or pigs, pork especially, for example. I once heard that uh, the average pig has kind of like the emotional or the intelligent uh, capacity 
as a typical three-year-old human being. So for a lot of people out there, myself included, to a certain extent, it's kind of hard. I mean, like, look, I have a dog. Like, I love my dog. Like, look at her, she's adorable. She is similar in terms of intelligence and emotional capacity as a typical, you know, in the case of a pig, and it might make it somewhat difficult for me from an ethical standpoint to consume those, those animals. Now, again, this is totally up to, you know, your personal ethical beliefs, the individual. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say anything, but if you're an individual who might have an issue with that, however, you don't feel like becoming a full-blown vegetarian or vegan because you don't want to survive on nothing but, I don't know, broccoli and tofu for the rest of your life, you want to still consume animals, maybe these might be kind of a compromise. Like, look, I, I don't want to, I don't want to insult the precious little scallop, but like, what the fuck? It, it's not, it's one step away from pretty much being a vegetable. Like, I, I get it, they are still animals, but it's kind of hard to compare an oyster or a, a mussel to a pig. So I know that this is kind of a weird reason to include these on the list, but if you're someone who does take this seriously, this might be, you know, a decent compromise for you. All right, next up, lentils, buckwheat, beans, TVP, which probably you guys don't even know what that is, but we'll get to it in a minute, and tofu. Pretty much we're looking at non-animal based uh, protein sources or side dishes, what, you know, whatever you want to call it. Now, right off the bat, you guys might be thinking, Igor, I don't care about this stuff. Like 2% of your, you know, your audience here on YouTube is vegan. Just, just skip this crap. No, no, no. A big reason why I included this is because it is cheap as shit. Buckwheat and beans and TVP has almost as much, if not more, uh, protein per the actual dollar spent as opposed to things like chicken breast, the very holy grail of like the cheap man's uh, bodybuilding. Now, that being said, before you guys start celebrating, especially you, you know, broke guys in high school and college, you think like this is the answer to my prayers, there is kind of a big problem. The protein quality score is not that great. I mean, we're talking a solid 30, 35, 40 points in some case lower than pure animal-based protein sources like fish, chicken, and beef. Essentially, yeah, it's got a lot of protein, but number one, they're incomplete, and number two, your body can't necessarily absorb and utilize it as it could if we're looking at an animal-based product. And this is the second and very big problem. There is so much other stuff in these foods because at the end of the day, they're not protein sources. They are fiber and carbohydrate sources, which happen to have other stuff in them as well, other stuff like protein. And the other problem is, I don't know how anyone could ever cut on this. When you are cutting, the whole point is trying to maximize protein and maybe not minimize, but mitigate other calories, particularly from carbohydrates and fat. As someone who has to diet on like 21, 2200 calories, I don't know how you could possibly do that unless you A, up your cardio, or B, reduce your fat intake to like nearly negligible uh, amounts. Now, one actual option on this list, TVP, this is actually pretty good. This is called textured vegetable protein. It's kind of like a substitute, a vegan substitute to ground beef. It's kind of like this weird dry stuff. It kind of looks like cereal or cardboard and like uh, you put boiling water in it or you microwave, it inflates kind of like pasta or rice or something. And then on its own, it doesn't have much taste, but if you put it in food, if you put it with sauces and stuff, it's, it's actually not bad. And unlike the other options on this list, it's pretty good. From a price standpoint, it's protein quality score is a little bit better than these options, but obviously still not as good as like chicken or tuna or something. And the amount of carbs is actually not too bad. This is something which even to this day, even though I'm not a vegetarian, I'm not a vegan, I'm none of that stuff, I still sometimes do uh, cook with it. it. You know, it's not bad if you know how to work it. And it costs like, it's like five bucks on Amazon and it'll last you, it'll last you a long time unless you're, unless you're guzzling it down. And the last one I had to mention uh, is tofu. Uh, cost effectiveness, not that great. Protein quality, not that great. And it's also got a pretty good amount of fat. 15 grams for every 30 grams of protein. Again, it's not bad. And uh, I've cooked with it before. and I can make some pretty damn good teriyaki dishes, especially if you have the firm kind of protein. But as a primary protein source, unfortunately, it seems like the name of the game when it comes to vegan sources is that it's doable. It's not impossible, but it's kind of hard. Next up, eggs. Pretty much the world's most standard cliche protein source when it comes to bodybuilders. 
That being said, there are still a few little issues. But fortunately, one of them is not protein quality score because eggs actually have a perfect 100. The actual protein PDCAS score, the way it was essentially designed, they had to set something as essentially like the reference point for everything else, the highest value, and that value actually is eggs. Eggs come in at a perfect 100 on this score. In terms of a protein quality standpoint, in terms of absorption, bioavailability, uh, protein, uh, sorry, amino acid profile, eggs are fantastic. They are pretty much the best thing, one of the best things you can put in your body in terms of overall protein quality. Here in Canada, where by the way, grocery prices are actually kind of expensive compared to America. So for you guys, this might be even better. If you were to go with egg whites, this is where things start to break down a little bit. Because if you were to buy like 12 or 18 or whatever eggs, and you're essentially throwing out half the product that you pay for in terms of the yolks, kind of sucks because now you're losing what you kind of paid for. In this case, it brings it down to 16, which actually isn't that good. Now, the other sort of pseudo problem is the fat intake. Now, again, you, a lot of people can get into this. This is a crazy debate in the nutrition and fitness world that's been going on for years. Are eggs bad for you? You know, in terms of their fat intake, in terms of the fact that one egg has about 124% of your recommended daily intake of cholesterol. People are gonna argue and say like, oh no, that's not the same. It's not the same as cholesterol you'd find in like burgers and KFC. You know, there's the whole, you know, good cholesterol versus bad cholesterol. Are eggs healthy is a crazy topic that's been being debated for, for years now. So for the purposes of this video, we're not gonna get into that if you don't wanna do that, you don't want the fat, you don't want the cholesterol, feel free to just get egg whites, which by the way have zero cholesterol. However, when it comes to regular eggs, 25 grams of fat is kind of an issue. This is a big reason why for me, when I'm cutting down, especially in the summers, usually if I do have eggs, I'll have like five whites and then one whole egg and I'll kind of mix it in just to give it a little bit of that, you know, that good uh, egg yolk flavor. Dairy, we are gonna be specifically looking at regular old 2% milk, 0% uh, skim milk, Greek yogurt, specifically the 0% fat variety, and finally just cheese in general. Now, from a financial standpoint, dairy is actually not bad. Coming in somewhere in the 20s, the real benefit is that similar to eggs, the majority of dairy sources are actually a perfect 100 when it comes to the overall protein quality uh, score. The only problem when it comes to dairy is that it, because it's kind of like a weird, I mean, again, what is milk, right? It's supposed to be like this magic liquid that is supposed to take a baby cow from like 20 pounds to 500 pounds over the course of like what? Six, eight, 12 months. It's got a lot of nutrients. It's got a lot of calories. And although it's got a lot of protein, it's got a lot of other stuff as well. Per 30 grams of protein, you're getting 18 grams of fat, 46 grams of carbs. Again, if you're bulking, not a problem. If you're cutting or if you're kind of, you know, trying to mitigate external calories might be a little bit of an issue. This is a little bit better when it comes to 0% skim milk, but still, you know, there's no fat, but there's still a crazy amount of carbohydrates. However, when it comes to yogurt, specifically 0% Greek yogurt, this really isn't as much of a problem coming in at only eight grams of carbs and pretty much a negligible amount of fat. This is actually fantastic, and this is why Greek yogurt is actually a fantastic protein source. We'll come back to this later in the video, but this actually may be one of the best overall protein sources that you can get in terms of protein quality, in terms of cost effectiveness, and in terms of having secondary, or in this case, a lack of secondary uh, macronutrients. And finally, when it comes to cheese, I just left this one as kind of a question mark. It's kind of a wild card because there's like 7,000 different versions of cheeses and cuts and types. And I will say that a big personal favorite of mine, I used to have this when I was a kid. My mom would pack these in my lunch when I was like eight or nine years old. Um, Baby Bell cheese, you know look, those little, these little ones? They're not bad, they're regular, but they now have a light blue, uh, light version, and those have around 2.5 grams of fat for every five grams of protein, and I absolutely love those. They taste fantastic, it's a nice little like quench when I want something salty, instead of me reaching for like chips, especially when I'm dieting, I'll reach for like one or two of these Baby Bell cheese. It'll give me a very easy, relatively inexpensive 10 grams of protein and a variety of other things which I don't remember off the top of my head. 
And now the moment you guys have all been waiting for supplements. This may seem kind of cliche, but I can honestly say that supplements in general are by far the best protein source, which is kind of not surprising since that's kind of what they were made to be. Now, you guys have probably heard this before, but like wonder like, is that actually true? Is that just a bullshit marketing ploy used by the supplement companies? No, no, it's actually legit. Right off the bat, similar to eggs and other dairy sources, whey protein, in this case we got whey and whey protein isolate, is a perfect 100. This is the best quality protein you can get. This is made a little worse when it comes to more uh, vegan sources like soy and pea protein, which comes in sort of like in the 80s and mid 70s, but it's still not bad, especially can, you know, in comparison to other non animal-based proteins, you know, like, like nuts and wheats and, and pasta. Now, here is where things really kick off, and this is what really makes protein supplements the best source that you can get, is from a dollar standpoint. I remember being a 19-year-old kid in college, I remember seeing protein supplements marketed to me that were like two pounds of super mega awesome protein for only $69.99, and I'm thinking, where the fuck do you get off charging that. For example, when it comes to my protein, uh, looking at their impact way as an example, this comes out to 30 grams of protein uh, per dollar spent. However, that scared my dog. If you use my discount code VITVIP and get yourself a staggering 40% off, this actually lowers all the way down, or in this case increases, to 50 grams of protein per dollar spent, which when you combine that with the fact that there's very little other stuff, very little carbs, if any fat, and a perfect 100 PDCAAS, whey protein is, at least on this list, the highest quality, the most bang for your buck protein source that you can get. Now, when it comes to uh, whey isolate, which has a little bit less carbs and fat, if you're someone who is really, really focused on cutting down excess secondary macronutrients, maybe you're dieting, maybe, you know, whatever reason you may have, this is still pretty damn good, coming in a little bit less at 46 grams of protein uh, per uh, dollar spent. Uh, when it comes to soy and pea, this is actually even better. 62 grams of protein per dollar, 51. These are, in terms of bang for your buck, in terms of quality of protein, in terms of having nothing but protein, in terms of secondary macronutrients. I know it's cliche to say that supplements are the best source, but the numbers back it up. They really are. That's it guys, the video is over. I've been talking for two hours. My voice is dying. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I appreciate each and every one of you. Don't forget to like, subscribe, send this video to your friend, your mom, your grandma. Be like, what's up, grandma? You want to get jacked? Follow this guy. And I'll see you in the next video.